So what's on your mind when it comes to women's health? We recently hit the streets to find out, and now joining me to answer your questions is Leah Milheiser. Welcome to the show, Dr. Leah. Thank you. It's great to be back. So there's always a lot of questions, and I think women especially of all ages mm -hmm. start having questions about their, their health. When do you find that that's... What age do you find it? You know, across all ages in women, starting at puberty, you look at girls who are dealing with body image issues and peer pressure about drugs and alcohol and sex and just questions about puberty in general. Then you go to 20 and 30 year olds and they're dealing with infertility issues and how to manage, you know, job and kids. And then postmenopausally, you're dealing with, do I go on hormones or not? What do I do <laughs> about bone health? So really at any age, we see questions coming up. It's always something and we actually went out on the street and asked a few questions, so we're going to try to get one right now. Let's see what they had to say. Um, I'm Mary Betancourt from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and my question is, is it true that when uh, women are on birth control, uh, does it lower the sex libido? That's a good question. That is a very common question that we as gynecologists get all the time. So something that doesn't really come up when a woman is speaking with her doctor because we're thinking more about not getting pregnant. Well, wouldn't you know it that the pill that you go on to not get pregnant may actually keep you from having sex because it lowers <laughs> your interest. And the reason that happens, and it does happen commonly, is that birth control pills will lower a woman's circulating testosterone levels. Testosterone is what's related or one of the factors related to sex drive. And it's not just libido, it's also vaginal dryness and pain with sex. So if a woman is having these issues, she should definitely speak to her gynecologist or her physician about it to see if there's a non-hormonal contraception she can try or maybe just lowering the dose of hormones that she's on. And if it's a vaginal dryness issue or a pain with sex issue, then she should definitely try a silicone-based lubricant that will help. How it's actually good for you health-wise. Here to tell us more about it is our friend Dr. Leah Milheiser, an OBGYN at Stanford University Medical Center. She's live in Woodside getting happy hour started early. Hi Leah. Hi Janelle, how are you? We're here at the Woodside Bakery and Cafe down in Woodside and I'm here with my great friends Dr. Mary Jacobson and Dr. Lynn Gretkowski, the founders of Wine Doctors, and today we are drinking to our health. Now when we're talking about the benefits of wine for health, we're talking about drinking in moderation. So what exactly does that mean for women and what does it mean for men? Well, the FDA defines moderate consumption as one glass for women okay. and two glasses for men. And a glass is defined as five ounces of 12% alcohol wine. Which is what we have here. That's right. Okay. And how much is this? That's 10 ounces. And this is appropriate for men? That's right. Okay. So what happens if we drink more than that prescribed amount every day? Are we going to lose those wine benefits? We've had this change in guidelines over the last several years, and we used to advise women that if you weren't at increased risk because of a family history, then you should have your first routine mammogram or baseline mammogram between age 35 and 40. We actually don't recommend that anymore. Oh, okay. Now we say that if you're at average risk, that you should start your first mammogram at age 40 and then have one every year thereafter. There are different groups, the American Cancer Society, the American College of OBGYN, who have a little bit different views in terms of when women or how mm -hmm. frequent women between age 40 and 50 should be screened. In general, it's about every year that we recommend. Okay. So, and that's for the general population. If you're at increased risk, then that screening may actually start earlier. So if you have that BRCA gene, you're going to start Start your mammogram plus an MRI, which we'll talk about, at age 25, for example, or if you simply had a mother or a sister who was diagnosed but perhaps no gene mutation in your family, then you're going to start 10 years earlier than that person in your family, the age that they had it. So if your mother had it at age 40, you're going to start your screening at age 30. Okay, and you were talking about this MRI and the mammogram. Right. So this is actually a newer recommendation. So the reason that they've added MRIs is because what they found, unfortunately, mammograms do have about a 15% false negative risk, and that's actually a little bit higher in younger women because they have denser breasts, as well as women who, are, who have, for example, this BRCA mutation. We know that the mammogram isn't as reliable for them in terms of detecting a cancer. So what we have them do is we have them start a mammogram and an MRI at age 25. They do this every year, mm. as well as women who have had any sort of chest wall radiation. So women who underwent uh, treatment for uh, you know, Hodgkin's lymphoma, for example, okay. between the ages of 10 and 30, they would also be candidates for this. Or any woman who's got what's considered a 20% lifetime risk or greater of developing breast cancer, they would also uh, be candidates for MRI and mammogram. And of course